Yeah, so all of my plans just went out the window. Super fun. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing anymore. All right. First thing we're gonna to need to talk about is everything that we're gonna to need to actually make a full five gallons of beef from start to finish. So first off, tool wise, we need two buckets. Since we're five gallons, we need six and a half gallon buckets because you need head space in there. Otherwise you're gonna get the red geyser that just stains everything everywhere. Um, need this, we need the measuring cup to pitch the yeast, we need the thermometer to make sure the yeast is at the right temperature, and a hydrometer to make sure that we have the right alcohol level that we want. On top of that, I'm gonna lay my little stuff over there. We've got a clearing agent, there's a bunch of different kinds. Um, and then we've got a, the exact name of it, but basically it's a siphon, right? You stick the hose on this end, you stick this end in the mead, you stick the other end in the, your second bucket, and that's how you're going to transfer it later on. But that'll be a part two. So we don't need this for right now, but that's what we need. Oh, we need a giant spoon to mix our honey. Don't reach into the bucket. And we need a one way valve. Um, tool wise, that's it. That's what I like about meat is it's super easy. It's hard to get infected. So you don't have to, you want to clean everything a crazy amount, but if you happen to have forgotten something, if you didn't clean something properly enough, the properties of the honey should prevent it from getting infected and becoming completely useless and spoiling the batch. Because honey's not cheap. Speaking of honey, we got our ingredients, right? So we got we got five gallons of water. We're using spring water instead of tap water because um, tap water has fluoride in it. It's got a bunch of chemicals, and it could it can make the mead turn out bad. So if you've got filtered water on hand, that's cool. I just use spring water because it's everywhere and it's relatively cheap. Uh, honey, <laughs> 15 pounds of it. And this is where mead gets really, really expensive. Uh, honey isn't cheap. I think my, the store that I go to, this turned out to be about 40 bucks, which isn't bad, but it's not great honey. We're using clover honey because that's the most common kind, but Clover honey isn't the best for me. It's not gonna make a bad meat, but it could be better. There are other websites out there that have uh, pure orange blossom, they've got cherry, they got blueberry, they've got maple. I saw a website somewhere that had killer bee honey, which would be super fun to make meat out of, but that's really, really expensive. So we're gonna stick with the cheap stuff for now. All you need to make sure of when you're making a mead is that it's actual pure honey. It's not pasteurized, it's not messed with, there's no additives, no preservatives, it's just honey. If you got that, you make it fine meat. And since this is going off of Valheim, which has raspberry meat in it, we've got <coughs> roughly 40 ounces of raspberries, which will give it, you don't need quite this much. Meat is easy in that you can put anything in there, really. Raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, um, mint, vanilla think of a flavor that you like and chances are you can make a mead out of it i think somebody somewhere made a pure jelly mead i don't know necessarily about that but fruit wise you can put anything in there and there's two different ways we're going to add it for the fermentation process or during the fermentation process the other way is to it's not back sweeten i forget the actual name of it but just to keep moving basically once the fermentation is, is just about done then you would add the raspberries in. Um, but just to make the whole process easier, we're adding the raspberries first. All right, and last but not least, the super big boy uh, for this batch, we're using Lauvin. Lauvin? Yeah, D47 yeast. There's a bunch of different kinds with different alcohol percentages. Um, look at what you want. The one I used to use prior, because I've made probably five or six batches of, of yeast prior, or um, of mead prior to this. And I used to use, I believe it was champagne yeast, which had a much higher alcohol probability. Um, and then lastly, we don't really need it, but we're gonna throw it in there. This is just yeast nutrient. I forgot where I bought it from. This is, I don't even know how old. Two, three years? Couple. Um, okay, I guess all that's left to do is to start mixing stuff together. Let's see how fast this is first. Because we're not going to add it, is it? Must be f***ing have to 
and send myself to the emergency room on, on stream. So the way you sanitize everything is by using, um, there's a specific kind of cleaner out there. I prefer, it's called Star Sand, S-T-A-R hyphen S-A-N. Like Clorox and stuff, right? You, you don't want Clorox to be left in here. It'd be bad for everybody involved, including the yeast. Um, but what this stuff does is it basically finds the germs and it will split the cell walls apart and basically eat the bacteria alive. Pretty f***ing brutal to be honest with you. Um, and if some of it is left over, that's okay because the, the cleaning agent actually winds up acting like a, almost like a food source, right? So especially star sand, it's super bubbly. And when you sit there and cause you, you rinse every, you soak the crap out of everything, you use a brush, getting all the nooks and crannies, you want everything to be super clean. It's, it gets super foamy and then you lay it all out on the mat. So you put it all in there, it's all bubbly. You put it out and the bubbles don't go away. And when you're first starting out, that's super nerve wracking. Cause you know, anytime you do dishes, the last thing you want to do is leave soap in there. With star sand, not a big deal. All right. So now, there we go. All right, I'll put this off to the side. We still got two more. And now comes the fun part. Because when you're making mead, you wanna make sure everything is super aerated. The honey and water are perfectly, are really, really well mixed together. Again, like I said, all the bubbles that are left over from soap is uh, pretty worrisome at times. And what this process is also doing is aerating, if I didn't already say, it's aerating the crap out of, um, out of the honey and the water, which you need the oxygen for the yeast to be able to live because living organisms need oxygen. But that one, here it is. All right, let's add the rest of this. And in case you're wondering about total price, like if you had none of this at all and you were able to find the cheap honey, um, it would be about probably 120, 130 bucks all said and done. Like the raspberries, the honey, the water, the yeast nutrient, the yeast itself, the bucket, the siphon, um, the clearing agent, the hydrometer. It's all, um, it's not too expensive. Let's stir this again. Get any less honey out of there before we add our next bit. They have um, they have mixing drill bits, but I'm cheap. Those mixing drill bits cost about thirty dollars, and I was like, yeah, I'm just better with lots of honey. I don't feel like I don't feel like doing anything else. So yeah, so I'm doing it manually. All right, up and over. I have tried to reach out to local apiaries before, and I've gotten pretty decent prices on on 15 pounds. I think one place back in Florida had um, had 15 pounds for about 60 bucks, which isn't bad. Basically, anything anything under 100, I'm I'm good with. And we're stirring. And we're stirring. Oh my god, my wrist already hurt. And that's what I see about the gallon carboys is when you're trying to do this, you don't have to use this dumb spoon to mix all this dumb honey. You can just pick it up and shake every looking crap out of it. Throw it in your car and go on for a go from the bunkest road you can. My elbow now. It's out of my wrist into my elbow. Ow! Eh, Swapping hands. Yep, looks like honey water.
In technical terms, this is actually called the must. The initial ingredients plus the yeast and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> I have five, it's okay. When we do a part two on this, we'll be doing something called racking, and that's what that cane and uh, hose was for. We're going to rack the mead off of, called lease, L-E-E-S, lease, lease. I'm an adult, I'm an adult, that wasn't funny, hang on. Now I'm just trying to aerate it as much as possible because I'm fairly certain all the honey and water should be mixing it properly. So now, oh my god, this is the tiniest red I've ever seen. Tiny raspberries. It's a small. The recipe that I got this from talked about freezing, freezing your fruit. Um, <clears throat> helps break down the cell walls, so that way when you finally stick it in the mead, it will um, dissolve better, be taken in by the yeast better, what have you. So, we froze them, but the instructions that I read this from complained about the fermentation process not starting for a while. And I thought about it, and in the instructions, they threw it, they threw the raspberries in there completely frozen. The way I figure it, yeast yeast is kind of temperamental, right? When we pitch the yeast, which we're about to do here shortly, we have to get the water that we're about to pour it into to a certain temperature. And then we sit there and mix it all up and wait for it to get ready. And then we pour it in and then you have to keep it at about room temperature because if it's too cold, the yeast takes forever. If it's too hot, you can kill the yeast, it's the whole thing. So the way I figure it, the reason why his yeast didn't take off immediately is because the raspberries were frozen and it brought the temperature down enough to um, prevent the fermentation process until everything, the must got up to temperature and then the yeast started moving and then reproducing and then, you know, it basically just delayed the timeline. All right, let's throw this stuff in here. And again, one thing you've got to be constantly watching out for when you're doing this is headspace. When that fermentation process kicks off, especially since we're using a fruit and yeast nutrient, this is probably going to take off like a bat out of hell. And for that specific reason, this will be kept in our shower. Nowhere with a carpet. We're not going to put it in our closet. We're not going to put it anywhere with anything that could possibly get stained. Because if this isn't enough headspace, and it does take off, in other words, explode, yes. Just a little bit, about two tablespoons. One, two, ish. In case you're wondering, when you're when you're pitching the yeast, the directions are on the back. Anywhere between 95 and 98.6. So for a just a one gallon batch, you don't need a whole packet of yeast. All you need is about maybe half, maybe even less. It's not a huge deal that you get the measurement perfectly right. Again, they're just germs and you'll, if, if they don't have enough to live on, they die. And in fact, that's most of the fermentation process is the yeast in there living and dying, living and dying, living and dying. I didn't clean the stone, so I'm using the needle of my thermometer to make everything go. Alright, now we're going to throw this in here. And that little bit is going to be the key factor, one of the key factors. It'll um, 
that little bit of yeast is going to turn into billions upon billions, probably trillions, honestly. I'm not a scientist, but I can see that. There's a joke about rabbits in there somewhere, but it's a nice big stir. I'm going to it some more. Get a little mosh pit going here of raspberries. Last but not least, about two tablespoons of yeast nutrient. Should I be measuring this? Yes. Am I going to? No. Why? Because I didn't clean a tablespoon either. We're only putting a little bit in there. Um, like if you're doing just mead, just honey and water and yeast, um, yeast nutrient would be really good. And if you didn't want to buy it, um, raisins. Raisins work as a, as a yeast nutrient. Now, they're not the best, but if you didn't want to go through the whole hassle of, you know, typing it into Amazon Prime and then clicking the buy button, if that's too hard for you, raisins work in a pinch. And if you don't have, if you don't want to buy a one-way check valve for the whole $3, you can also use a balloon with a pinhole in it. So let's recap. We have roughly about five gallons of water in there, <clears throat> probably a little less, maybe three and a half, four gallons. Um, what gave us the rest of the five gallons was the 15 pounds of honey. Now, for every gallon of mead you want to make, you need three pounds of honey. Okay? So it scales just like that. We've got our yeast, different yeast, different alcohol volumes. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a reading, right? We're gonna take a specific gravity reading. And this is where actual brewing buckets come in handy. So down here where it says um, alcohol by volume chart, you've got your original gravity, which we're about to take, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna circle that. And then over here, you've got your final gravity. And then you take the two, say it comes out at 1.065, and then we have 1.01, right? So then we can follow the chart over and we get, it's gonna be a 7.1 um, alcohol by volume meat. Different yeast, different amount of sugars, things like that will affect all of this. That's where my handy dandy little hydrometer comes in. So, we're just gonna boop. We're gonna try and clear some of these bubbles off of here, because that makes it really hard to read, and then we'll drop it in. Turn it back to where it's supposed to be. And we're reading at about 1.1. I don't know if you can see that all the way down there. So 1.1 is our beginning gravity. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> the highest this goes is 1.95. So we'll do we'll do 1.95. Mark that for later. Mate, I just did a nice long line so I know exactly which column we're doing in case some of this gets erased throughout the process. Because this will take a couple weeks in total. Clamp this lid down. Alrighty. So now, take a one way valve. We'll shove it in here. Nice and tight, just like that. And what makes it a one-way valve is how there's water in there. Whoops. That's fine. You can do it with regular water, and you can do it with sterilizing agent, actually. So what happens is, from this post, it goes straight up the middle, right? And then the air will eventually push the little bobber in the middle. It'll push it up, get forced down, and then out. Yep, so as long as this stays relatively contained, we'll be fine. If the fermentation process kicks off and this little guy isn't enough, that's how it goes. And then I spend an entire day cleaning bread out of the bathroom. So that is 
Oh. Oh. Really heavy. But that concludes today's um, lesson on how to make Valheim meat. All right, and um, we'll revisit this when it's time to rack, right? So what we're waiting for now is for the raspberries in here to lose their color. About a week. Ah, uh, six days. Somewhere around there. We'll do another one of these where we transfer this into that. And then we'll take another reading to see how the process has come along. If it's still fermenting like crazy, then we gotta let it go. If we wanted to keep it sparkling, then we would keep the fermentation going sort of kinda. We also need some other chemicals to kill the yeast, but it's a whole thing. But for right now, we're, we're where we need to be. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs>